Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. We're happy to welcome back Asaf Tachmias, who will tell us about percolation on the hypercube. Thanks uh, for the invitation. You, you can sit. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, um, I'm going to tell you about um, this uh, cute little uh, problem, percolation on the, on the hypercube. Uh, and this is all uh, joint work with uh, uh, Remco van der Hofstad from uh, Urandum. And again, uh, you all know me, I think, so please feel free to stop me whenever you want and, uh, and ask a question, make a comment, mockery, all uh, welcome. Uh, and here's, the, here's the, the basic model that we'll be dealing with. We have the, the hypercube, the, it's a graph. The vertices are vectors of, uh, of 0, 1 to the n. So, uh, and the edge sets are just the vectors of Hamming distance 1. And we also have a number between 0 and 1. And we perform the very basic uh, procedure of going over every edge in the graph, and independently we erase it with probability 1 minus p, or keep it with probability p. Right? And we get, we have a, a random graph left, and, you know, and we want to know, you know, what is this, what is this creature. And the first people who ever uh, looked at this model, I mean, in the, in the 60s, there was lots of work, uh, Erdős and Renyi, on the, doing this, this kind of procedure on the complete graph, and we will always keep that in mind when we, we do certain things, so I'll, I'll try to go from here to there. There's a problem in this audience, is that some people know too much, and some people, you know, this is the first time they hear about it. So I'm going to try to balance, but I think it will be easier if uh, you just give me some input, so if there's something too quick or too slow, don't be shy. Um, First people who looked at this question were Erdős and Spencer at this model, and they were interested in uh, 79, and they were interested, you know, and, and what they showed is that they were interested when this graph is connected, this subgraph. They showed when, when this p is bigger than a half, what you get with very high probability is a connected subgraph. When p is smaller than a half, this doesn't happen. And, you know, the next, the next question that you can ask is, in, and that they didn't manage to solve is, when do you have a giant component, right? Just like uh, you do in the erdős renyi graph. Uh, and uh, they asked this in this paper, and, uh, and, uh, and, and this was solved in the, in the 80s by uh, the three Hungarians, so Aitai, Komlos, and Semeredi. Uh, in this few years that they had, you know, several three very influential papers, and uh, they showed the, very, the, the following result. Uh, so, uh, this is N. I, I warn you up front that there's going to be confusion in my, because it, it, it's confusing up here, uh, between the, the letter N and M. So, whenever you see an N, it's going to be an M, just because, uh -huh. uh, <laughs> I'm just saying that up front, just because in the paper we, we couldn't really decide what is the best thing, so uh, in, uh, so I call. Sorry. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it's always the dimension of the cube, right? Uh, well, no. Sometimes it will be the number of vertices in the erdős renyi graph, but uh, I'll try to make this. I'll try to make this clear. Uh, but there's there's this confusion that you know notation that you can't really escape. This is what they proved: p equals c over n, uh, and so. Uh, you scale it like this, c is a constant, c is always going to be a constant, large for large, small for small. If uh, c is smaller than 1, then the largest component is c1, okay, so now this c is not a constant, so, uh, is, uh, is at most uh, of size log of, the, log of the volume, log of the number of vertices, which is, uh, which is n, and uh, if c is bigger than 1, the largest component is of order 2 to the n, right? linear in the number of vertices. So this is in the, uh, 
In the Erdős-Renyi random graph in GNP, this is a classical, a classical thing that goes back to the 60s. Is everybody familiar with the Erdős-Renyi? I'm, I'm not going to define, you know, it's just the same thing on the complete graph. And this is a, the phase transition. Um, yes. All right. To the end there, it's the graph. This is not. This is on the hypercube. Oh. Thank you. Mm. All right, I'll take a note, mental note of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, the problem with this, so this is a, a relatively easy uh, assertion. Because uh, you could just perform this, this BFS exploration process on your random graph, and it's subcritical because see, it's smaller than one, and the degree, the degrees end. So this this follows rather easily. This is this was like the, uh, a slightly harder thing because uh, because you know in the Erdős Renyi you can actually do this comparison with a branching process, you know, to the to the limit, and you know you you get you know the correct thing. But here they needed this additional trick. Uh, to get to get this and this is it's called the sprinkling and I, I'm going to show it to you right now just because it's uh, it's interesting and um, it's going to be useful later. So how does the proof of two work? Proof of two. Uh, it's going to be a sketch, but it should be detailed enough that you can make this uh, you can work. So the first thing that you do is you write p as uh, you write you write it as p1 and p2 uh, such that p1 is going to be C1 over N with C1 still bigger than 1, uh, smaller than C. And P2 is going to be some small number over N in such a way that 1 minus P1 times 1 minus P2 equals 1 minus P. So the sprinkling, what, the, what that means, that means that you first draw, you pr first perform this edge percolation, you know, that's, you know, when you check if an edge is open or closed, with probability P1. Right? You get some subgraph that, and then what you what you could do because of this condition is draw another independent uh, uh, random graph with probability p two, and just you know union take the union of the edges, you know, and that's what you get. And you know it's just because of this fact, right? The probability that an edge doesn't exist is doesn't exist in number one and number two is just the same probability. It tells you that it's distributed exactly the same. Um, <clears throat> and then the proof goes like this. The first step uh, in P1 is that, uh, so here's the, here's the claim. With high probability, uh, there will be a linear, meaning bigger than 2 to the n, uh, vertices V such that the connected component containing V, this is how we write it, so this is the connected component containing uh, that V belongs to, uh, is bigger than 2 to the power, say, C2n. Right? Why, firstly, why is this true? So. Notice that this is still very, you know, this is still very far from 2 to the n. This is because of this small little constant here. But this is true because, 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 well, because when you, when you start exploring your BFS, so let's say you're, you start a vector of all zeros, and you look upwards, and you're only going to explore, say, until, you know, until the number of ones that you have is mo no more than, uh, say, uh, uh, m, n over 4. So for each of these vectors, you know, no matter where you're stuck in the set of no more than n plus n over four vectors, you always have, uh, and, and, and you look at the, um, you look at your forward cluster, right? You, you look at, you know, so you always have, um, let's say C1, for instance, let's say C was large enough. So you always have a lot of, ver uh, you have, you know, the, the neighbors, the amount of neighbors that you have instead of n is going to be three quarters over n at all times. Right? So, so you always have positive drift for this branching process. And you have to run it for very slow time. Right? You run it about m or you know, some constant times m time. And it's a, it's a supercritical branching process. And it has some positive probability of actually you know, growing. This is classical branching process things. And you know, if you take this C2 to be very small and this one quarter that I said to be very small, you can make everything work. 
and this worked. Yes, Omer. Sorry. This time should be more insistent and like not let me. No, no. <laughs> yes. C two is delta. No, no. It's another small constant. Soon you will see delta. All right. So this C two depends somehow on on C one, which depends on C. All right. Um, but is this is this step uh, clear? So you could do this from every vertex, and then there's a concentration argument telling you that, you know, these things will happen, you know, everywhere. So you get a graph, you know, so what you know about it is you have a lot of large components, but they're not large enough, right? They're not this, you get a graph, you know, there are a lot of things here, and in the next step, what we're aiming to do is to throw a lot of P2 edges that will, you know, that will connect a lot of these components into, like, one massive component that has linear size. All right, so uh, step two, <coughs> uh, step two is special in the sense that it actually, you know, so far we really use some very basic properties of the, of the geometry, but step two actually uses something about the hypercube and uses the, the isoperimetric inequality. So it uses the isoperimetric inequality. Uh, let me know if you need uh, uh, me to zoom in on the font. Uh, and I, I will not write this the most precise way. I'm just going to write a corollary of it, and here's what we use. Uh, if A and B, let A and B, A, uh, A, B, they are two disjoint subsets, two disjoint subsets uh, of linear size, linear size, yes, size theta 2 to the n, then there exists uh, a lot of disjoint paths connecting them of relatively short uh, length, then there exists uh, at least uh, 2 to the n over n to the 100 uh, disjoint paths of length what is the length that I should put here? At most, square root of uh, n, uh, connecting a and b. What are the th sets that you should think of? Where does this, where does this inequality is really saturated? You take a to be. So this is the, uh, this is a schematic of the of the hypercube, this is the vectors of all 1, this is all zeros, this is the equator, and you take a to be, uh, this is a minus square root of n from the equator, this is plus square root of n for the equator, you take uh, this to be a, this to be b, and really you can show that there are a lot of disjoint, disjoint uh, path between them, and they have to be really of length square root of n, that's the distance between the two sets. So this is, this is the real thing, and and but the statement is of course much stronger. It says that any anywhere you put these sets, you know, you'll get the same thing. How do you use this for for percolation? So, the hundred yes, <laughs> yes, the hundred. Uh, you can uh, you can fix it probably to a half. Uh, <coughs> but yeah, we don't we don't care about these you know these these numbers. All right. So what are what is our situation? In our step one, we have a lot. A lot of uh, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, clusters of this size, two to the c to, to the n, and we want to exclude the possibility that after the sprinkling, these do not create a giant component, so uh, of linear size. So if they if they do not create a giant component, the situation is so we have a linear. That means that we will be able to split them into two. All of these, you know, we'll put all the vertices into you know into two sets a partition of all these vertices here that we obtain at, at, at step number one, such that all of these paths connecting them are closed. And of course, none of these vertices here and here are going to be in the same component. Nothing is connected in, the, in this partition. Right? So let's figure out, you know, how many ways can we, parti can we, can we have, you know, how many ways, what is the number of partitions that we can have? Uh, so the number of partitions is going to be, um, in total we have 2 to the n vertices, right? But, uh, 
you know, this is the number of vertices in R. But like, of course, we want to put two connected vertices in the same partition, right? That's the, that's the definition. So, out of the two to the two to the n uh, ways to split these vertices together, we only get uh, two. The, we have to divide this by two to the c c two to the n, right? Because if you look at the component of a vertex, all of its all of its neighbors and sorry, all of its all of its component has to be on the same side of the partition. Right, so this is all the way that we can partition uh, our components into two linear sets. And now we're going to use the isoperimetric inequality that tells us this is a deterministic statement. So far, there's no probability right, that, that we have a lot of you know, paths, disjoint paths of length square root of n, and they all have to be closed. Right? Closed with respect to P2. Okay, this is where we use the independence. And the not closed, but containing a closed. Yes, yes, sorry, containing a close, right? Yes, so not open. Yeah. The probability that one particular path is not open is going to be 1 minus P2. P2 is delta over n uh, to the power square root of n. Right? This is the probability that one particular path is not open, contains a closed edge. And uh, the number of these paths is uh, 2 to the n divided by n to the very sharp 100. Everybody agrees with this uh, calculation? And you know, now comes the tricky part of uh, actually figuring out that this is small. Uh, but this is indeed small. This, uh, you know, uh, this, this is the e to the, e to the, e to the, e to the, there's, um, Right, this is this is uh, this is e to the um, something to the log n to the square root of n, and this is. Does everybody see that this is you know? <laughs> this is e to the minus c two to the n, and perhaps a one minus little o of one here. Right, so this is you know this way. I'm eating all the polynomials, logarithm, you know, everything everything together. Okay. So this is the, the, the essence of the Aitai Komloshin Semiready proof, and, um, and you know essentially where we, we started we started our work. Are there any, is there any questions about this about this proof before I go on? Okay, great. So the question, of course, that you can ask yourself after you know, uh, or perhaps you you've seen other people ask is what happens when c equals precisely one, right? What is the uh, what is the size of the component, and um, you know what happens, and now comes you know. Okay, you're 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 starting to guess. You know, and as usual, this is the same behavior as Erdős and Reni. And you would think to yourself, okay, so first thing I need to know is what happens in in Erdős and Reni, right? So in Erdős and Reni, this is what happens very briefly. Uh, so now this is G N P. Now I'm performing it. This is on the complete graph, uh, Alex. So now this is now no dimension, right? And and P, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> right, and p is approximately one over n. So there is like a very intricate phase transition that, uh, luckily, the, none of the uh, people who invented it is here. So I don't need to be careful about all the. All right. Okay, what I'm going to write was proved first by Bolabash with logarithmic corrections, which were later removed by Wuchak, and some of the things here are due to Aldous. So. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> See, I can see Uval is very unhappy, but this is this is what happens. <laughs> very happy. I'm glad I can be of service. So you look at one over n. So the, firstly, the first fact is that the size of the component is going to be the number of vertices to the power two thirds. But not only but not only that, you can also move a little bit from one over n and get the same the same effect. One plus o of n to the minus one third divided by n. And the statement is, when this is your p, then your largest component is of order um, uh, n to the two-thirds. And moreover, uh, uh, I want to state this, and it is not concentrated. Not concentrated. Uh, meaning that if you take this largest component, divide by n to the two-thirds, and you will find that you, you get a limiting random variable which is non-trivial and it's supported on zero infinity. Right? So there really is a positive, you know, positive variance on the normalized. Let me also comment that the expected value of the cluster in this, in this regime 
is, is actually of order n to the one-third. Because, of course, this is the largest component. This is just a typical cluster. Um, there's, there, this one-third, of course, and two-thirds are very much connected. But what happens, so you can ask yourself, is really, you know, does, is this what really happens? You know, is this, you know, this is the scaling window of the random graph, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, sorry? Maybe you mean average cluster, not typical. Ah. Uh, okay. I'm not sure I understood this comment, but uh, but here's the. Uh, the expectation of C of V is much larger than the typical value of C of V. For most V, C of V is small. The expectation correct. Right. Yes, that is true. Typically, you're, when you start exploring for a vertex, you have probability n to the minus one third of being in the the largest one, and the rest is you know kind of not very important. That's why the majority comes from here, even though that, even that is not precise, because you see components in all scales. Uh, oh, anyhow, why is this n to the minus third sharp? Because here is the, the, next, the next theorem. Uh, this is your p. Epsilon is really bigger than n to the minus third. Right? This is the condition. Then uh, c1 divided by 2 epsilon n goes to 1. Notice that by this condition on epsilon, this value is really larger than n to the two-thirds. And furthermore, uh, c2 divided by epsilon n goes to zero. So this is in this situation, and in this situation, actually, in, in the first one, c2 is of the same order as also n to the two-thirds. So here you see something like this. In number one, you see a bunch of uh, small components, but you know, n to the two-thirds, but they're Yes, sorry. Epsilon here is also tending to zero, but as, as slow as you want. Right, the, the fixed epsilon is covered by a theorem of this, of this form. Right? And here is where you actually see you know, one significant component that looks larger than the rest of them. Right? And this is a, a smooth transition between this and this. Right? And the important thing also for me to, to state is that this quantity is concentrated. Uh, there's also a theorem for what happens below, for p, which is 1 minus epsilon, and it's, you know, in the similar fashion, you see, you know, you see concentration, but it still looks, still looks like this. It's, it, you know, I'm not going to go into that because I'm going to deal mostly with, with this kind of supercritical case. So this is what happens in, um, in, uh, in, in G and P. And the first thing you would want to say, you know, all right, um, then obviously, because the, you know, there shouldn't be any difference, because we saw one theorem that there's no difference, so you know, why should every, anything behave differently? Uh, so can you show that when you percolate on the hypercube at 1 over n, uh, you get a cluster, this time the cluster should be of size 2 to the n over times 2 thirds, right? Volume, the number of vertices to the power 2 thirds. But there is a problem, so the problem the problem is that so many people call this value or one particular value of it the, the critical probability or PC or whatever whatever you want. And the problem is is that uh, in in the hypercube uh, the critical probability PC is really not one over n. Uh, really is uh, you know this is undefined. You see, and now I can see Uval is a little less happy uh, by his smile. Uh, <laughs> but what I mean here is that, but, and this could be a formal thing, if you percolate, so here's a fact, if you percolate exactly at p, which is 1 over n, on the hypercube, the hypercube has very short cycles and a relatively large degree, that's the, that's the a relatively small degree, that's the difference between, between g and p and the, and the hypercube, you will find that the largest component is at most n to some power or with high probability, whatever. All right, so this is definitely not, you know, and what we're looking for is, you know, is volume to the power two-thirds. If we believe, so here comes, you know, there's this belief always in this background, you know, a lot of physical words that, you know, that these models are high-dimensional enough so everything should behave the same because it's a, it's a critical statistical physics model. But, you know, I'm just repeating words that I read and heard and can't really explain this. But the truth is, um, 
that you do see, so the point of this talk is to, to, to tell you that you do see this phenomena here, this, you know, this phase transition, but the, the problem is, and, and the problem with this whole project, and that's why it's also taking so long, is that, is that it doesn't happen at this point that you can write down very nicely as 1 over n, and in fact, it happens you know, in some other point, which is 1 over n plus 1 over n squared. Second term is, third term is 7 over 2 uh, over n cube plus and some o to the n to the minus 4. No one knows what's the fourth, uh, fourth uh, coefficient. And um, I, I don't think no one really cares. Sorry? What is the window? What is the window? And the window will be, the window will be this. So we, I'm, I'm coming to this, to this statement. But first I want to, uh, to explain you know, the, the first key idea in this. You know, so essentially, uh, or, sorry, I forgot to mention one theorem. So we were here. We were at the 80s. Uh, now we're at the 90s. At the 90s, you know, in this group, uh, Bolobash, uh, Koyakawa, and Wuchak, they decided, OK, let's, let's take a step forward. And they showed you know, what you kind of want to show. Uh, they showed that um, when p is 1 plus epsilon over n, but this time epsilon has to be very large, log cube of n divided by n, then the largest component divided by 2 epsilon 2 to the n goes to 1. All right, so this is what they proved. But notice that this is, this is weak, right? Because we want, we want this condition, right? And in the, in the hypercube, this condition translates. You want to write something, a theorem that, is, that holds when, p, when epsilon is larger than uh, 2 to the minus n over 3. So this is very weak, and I, in fact, in my notes, I plan to show this first. But you can't, of course, you can't improve their theorem because, because we know, well, we don't know yet, but you know, we know that you know, it doesn't really happen at this location. The, the correct place to, you know, it's one, one, over, 1 plus epsilon times something, but the something is not going to be 1 over n. The question is, what is this something? And this was first uh, investigated by uh, Borgs, Chase, Van der Hofstadt, Slade, and Spencer. And they came up with the following uh, very neat definition. And they said the following. Uh, Borgs, Chase, Van der Hofstad, Slade, and Spencer. One, two, three, four, five. At O, five. And they said, define, here's a definition, define PC as, uh, here it is, the expected size of a cluster at a vertex is of order is precisely 2 to the n over 3. Yeah. Right. Volume to the one third. Right. Just, like, just like you have here. And note that you can always do this because on the right hand side you have a monotone polynomial that goes from uh, 0 to 2 to the n and you're just choosing the point that it equals that. Right. And what did they show? They showed showed that at uh, p equals pc 1 plus o of uh, now 2 to the minus n over 3 right so the same so they showed a statement close to close to, to number 1 you look at this then the largest component is of order 2 to the you know a volume to the power 2 thirds with high probability and in fact it's also uh, Haydenreich and Van der Hofstad showed that also that it's not concentrated. But what they lacked is, you know, is you know a, a statement of this form, right? That when you go a little bit above this uh, volume to the one minus one third, you actually get, you know, you see a giant component. So. And technically, you know, theoretically, if you just have this statement, you don't know that if you, if I put here something much bigger than this correction, you know, it could be staying still in this, in this same situation. Cameraman probably hates me right now. Uh, so here's, here's what they conjectured back. Uh, so their conjecture was that take this PC and write down P as PC 1 plus epsilon, and epsilon as before, is little o of 1 and bigger than uh, 2 to the minus n over 3. 
then uh, C1 divided by 2 epsilon n goes to 1. Uh, it's the opposite of the little o. So the, the, the ratio goes to infinity. Yes. We'll write it little omega. You write it little omega. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this is their conjecture, and this is what we proved. So the theorem, uh, uh, which is still in the process of, of uh, final touches, is, uh, to, uh, is yes. All right. Uh, is there any question about the statement of the theorem? Um, yes, they did have a. Sorry, what, did you, what, what is this a funny <laughs> kid? Okay. So where does this expansion for PC? Where is that proved? Oh, uh, thank you. This is uh, this is. Uh, Hara, Slade, and Van der Hofstad. And is it the same definition? Yeah, this is this definition. So when, when I wrote by this, I meant that this is the value that, uh, that in which you get this, right? And they suppose that there are like infinitely more coefficients, and, and it's an asymptotic, you know, it doesn't necessarily converge to the right place. It's just a, uh, the fourth term, I think, is still unknown. Or perhaps the fifth term is still on. Uh, I think they kind of gave up on the, you know. Also, you know, when you don't really con suspect that it converges, then, you know, then, then you know, who cares? Um, all right. Uh, so before I'll tell you some things about the proof, unless there are any questions, let me just tell, let me tell you what is more or less a general statement. So our, our, our method kind of, kind of really uses a, some random walks estimates and their connection with, with percolation and you know and eventually you know you write this down you discover what you really use and this is what we use uh, so there's um, the general statement is the following so the general statement for instance will allow this theorem with exactly as written with this PC and every time that you have ends involved every time you can switch, you can translate by taking v, which is going to be the number of vertices, to be 2 to the n. Right? And then the statement that I'm going to write is going to be exactly, exactly this. And the general, this is not the right page, so the number of vertices is v, as we said, large v. The mixing time, the uniform mixing time of the of the uh, simple random walk or non-backtracking random walk, this is a bit of a, a technical issue, uh, is just going to be the first t. So everybody knows what a random walk is, right? This connection between the random walk and percolation, this is what I, I aim to, fo you know, to, to spend a little bit time on. Uh, the first time that, um, uh, uh, say, p, t, Zero, 0, your return probability um, is smaller than 1 over the, the vertex set, or V, you know, right? Uh, plus little o of 1. Right, this is uh, some, not a very standard definition, but uh, it's, you know, it's essentially the, the strongest mixing time that you can have. It means that the probability, essentially it means the probability of being at any particular vertex, 0, 0, always maximizes this quantity if I, if I replace this by another, another, on a transitive graph. Even that is not completely true, but, you know. Anyhow, this is the, you know, the time that it takes the, rand the distribution of the random walk after t steps to be close to uniform. What exactly the statement that we'll need for that, you will, you will see in, the, in what I'm going to show you. And then what do we need? Okay, so the conditions are the assumptions Assumptions. Is there a question? The assumptions are, one, the degree goes to infinity. So we have a sequence of graphs, degrees going to infinity, where, yes, Omer? Sorry, what is the zero, zero, uh, uh, zero is any vertex. We're only going to deal with transitive graphs, so it doesn't matter what vertex you start from. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah, <laughs> 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 
Okay. I thought it was a joke, but uh, and so the rest of them. Two. So this is you know two is the only significant condition. Uh, uh, one and three are technical, not very important. Here is the important uh, condition, P C that we defined in this uh, in this way, right? V to the one third so times the degree minus one to the power of the mixing time is no more, it's essentially 1 plus little o of 1. It equals. It's easy to show, by the way, that PC is always bigger than 1 over the degree minus 1 with this definition. So this really is, tells you something. I will show you exactly where this comes from. This looks a bit mysterious. And, and uh, 3 is another technical condition that I don't want to tell you what it is. Uh, something technical, which is, but also it, it's also a random walk technical. So it's usually something that it's easy to check. Some, you know, I can write this down for you if you're very much interested. Technical, random walk condition, but it's somehow it's a local condition. So it's how much, this condition in terms of random walk looks at you know how many cycles of length three, of length four, of length five do you have, and and things like that. All right, here it is. It's not going to enlighten you in any way. Uh, for every x, y, these are vertices. <laughs> <laughs> sum over u, v in the vertex set. Sum over the numbers s1, s1, s2, s3, from 1 to the mixing time of the return probability uh, s1 of x u, return probability of uh, u to v, not the return, the visiting probability. This, this is all, these are all random walks. And uh, s3 from uh, v to y uh, is smaller or equals to uh, the delta function at x y plus little o of 1. All right, so now you can all blame Yuval for seeing this uh, completely pointless line. Um, there's, I can explain this relates to something that's called the triangle condition, but uh, it's a random walk version of it, and it's not, you know, it'll be too, too deep inside uh, to go. But, sorry? Why is it useful? <laughs> no, it's not, but that's why Yuval asked the, the question. No. It, it, it kind of controls how your random walk behaves uh, before the mixing time, sorry. Yes, there's a lot. If you if you if you look at this, it essentially counts counts triangles and, and squares and all sorts of, of things like that. And they're all very close. It's things. It's squares. It's everything that is you know a square that is length at most the mixing time, right? So you don't get very long paths here because all these numbers are goes up go up to the mixing time. So it's some sort of a local condition. And you can verify these assumptions. For instance, here's a class of graphs that I like. Uh, take expanders, uh, not necessarily so. Okay, expanders say with finite degree. Uh, uh, so okay, this this theorem doesn't work, but it's for a technical thing. But never mind. Or expanders with degree log m, log log of the volume, and uh, which have uh, uh, logarithmic girth. The, with, together with the girth, you can easily verify. This condition, the mixing time, you know, you you know the degree, and you kind of need to estimate P C, which is uh, you know a little bit tricky, but but you can show. So for instance, this <laughs> logarithmic, say logarithmic degree, or right, and the girth, which is you know something that you can attain, a big large girth, right. Uh, yes. Yeah. It also works if you want for, for constant, for fixed degree, but then this 2 is not going to be correct here, right? If you, uh, if you have constant degree, then the survival probability of a branching process, Poisson 1 plus epsilon, is not 2 epsilon, but something, something else. All right, but these are all technical, uh, not very interesting things. Uh, what is the, how does the proof work? You exactly want it to work for an expander when it's transitive and the degree is just slightly tending to infinity. 
Uh, yes, it works under, but under some girth assumptions. Oh, oh, yes. No, it should work for any expander. This, this statement should be true for any expander, but with a different constant. But we don't know that. Yes. Uh, how does the proof work? I like this talk because I can give you the last line of the proof. So here's the last line. Uh, and, and, and I mean, I can give it to you and it actually makes sense. And it's not QED, I'm preparing for the joke. Right? So, uh, so here's the last line of the proof. I shouldn't have erased that. All right, the last line of the proof is going to look very similar to the, to the last line of the proof of step two that we saw in the Aitai Komlosh and Semeredi. Um, it will, it will, will tell us something interesting. So the, the last line, this doesn't work. The last line is going to be this. Uh, so remember, we, we are in this case that epsilon is bigger than 2 to the minus uh, n over 3. Now I'm back, you know, just for the sake of, you know, to be clear, I'm in the back in the hypercube setting. So here's the last line. It's going to be the last estimate. It's going to be 2 to the power uh, epsilon v, or epsilon 2 to the n, divided by k n epsilon to the minus 2. Uh, Kn is going to be, to, Kn is going to grow to infinity very, very slowly. This will correspond to this number of partitions uh, times 1 minus some fixed constant delta epsilon n to the power of epsilon square n to the 2n. <coughs> And, and you can, this one I can estimate. Uh, this will be exponential in uh, epsilon cube 2 to the n, which we know goes to infinity. And this will be uh, slightly smaller, right? So all of this is still x e to the constant epsilon cube 2 to the n, right? So again, this will correspond to our partition. So just by this, by let's reverse engineer uh, the proof. Uh, so we will have, so we will have, as you remember, in step one of this of the sprinkling argument, we find a lot of components, a lot of vertices, which their components are of size, are of big, right? So we know what we, so you know, the number of vertices, so the large would be large component in step one will be large will be bigger than this kn over epsilon to the minus two, and the number of components is going to be you know, and their number of these vertices in large is going to be bigger than epsilon 2 to the n. Right. So this is the first step. What does the second step tell us? Second step is more informative, or at least more innovative. Uh, you remember that previously we had this to the power square root of n, right? Because we can only found that the isoparametric inequality only allowed us to find paths of length square root of n, and this is indeed tight. And the main thing that we do here is getting rid of the isoparametric inequality and, and saying a statement of the form, percolation clusters cannot look like these extremal sets. They are closer to random sets, and hence they have to be closer to each other. They have to clump together. And what we will find is that these two such, uh, such percolation clusters will have a lot of paths of length 1 which are closed, or in other words, edges which are closed. Right? So if we... In the splitting, once we find a lot of large components and we try to split them together, what we will find out is that we have a lot of, a lot of closed edges. This is, looks long, but it's just one edge. And the number, of these, the number of these closed edges, <coughs> just by this, is going to be epsilon square n2 to the n. All right? So now... I need to explain to you, I'm not going to explain to you this part. Okay, this is, every part here requires some, some work and, and technology from, some from combinatorics, some from statistical physics, but this is, I feel, less interesting, and here is where you actually need to find this randomness built inside the, the percolation. And let me, uh, so this is, this gives you, you know, um, this will, you know, this is essentially what we prove. And I, I'm, I'm, I won't be able to show you the whole proof, of course, but I want to give you a hint. Well, how do you find, 
you know, where is this randomness hiding? And, there's, uh, and how do you use the simple random walk? Um, so I'm going to show you a very small, simple inequality, and then try to give you a hint on, on how it's used to prove something like this. Okay, is there any question about this uh, very high-level proof? All right. So here's the inequality. Uh, lemma. So before the lemma, a little thing, a little uh, e expose. Uh, so what what is the uh, uh, what is special about G and P, or you know, what is a very convenient thing about it, is that if you look at this function, uh, the connective function, the probability the two vertices are connected. Okay. Then this, as long as these are two different vertices, is the same number. It's the constant function. Right? It's the same number for any two vertices just because of symmetry. In the, for any p also. For the hypercube, we can't expect such a thing to hold. Right? If you're looking at your immediate neighbor, right, your, the probability that you are connected to it is, you know, is you know, something like, you know, if, if, if we're looking at pc, which is close to 1 over n, then this is going to be about 1 over n. But the probability for any, for anything on the equator to be connected to is going to be 2 to the n over 3, divided by the size of the equator because of symmetry. Right? So we're working here at pc, not in a general uh, p. Divided by 2 to the n divided uh, times square root of n. Uh, divided by square root of n, right? So this number is much smaller than this. So of course you can't expect such a thing to hold. The lemma tells you that you can still retrieve the symmetry that you see in the, in the erdos renyi random graph in the following sense. So we're not going to look at the event that x and y are connected to each other. We're going to consider the event that they are connected to each other in a long path. So um, the probability that they are connected in a path, and here comes the perhaps surprise, this, this length needs to be at least the mixing time. The probability that two vertices are connected is going to be at most the expected cluster size divided by the number of vertices to the power of n with a small correction. So path that's that long or the shortest path? And this is, this is for every x and y. And this is, okay, so the, the stronger statement, so the probability that there exists M lo a path doesn't necessarily have to be the longest path, the shortest path. They could be, connected by a they could be also be connected by that. Mm -hmm. and, and the advantage of this statement is that it's true uniformly for all the vertices. So, and this kind of thing, so we will, you know, I believe that this should be something general that should hold you know, in two-dimensional lattices and, and all of these reasonable graphs that you perform percolation. Of course, what, what does it mean? Of course, in a two-dimension torus, you don't expect to put here the mixing time to get this. You expect to put some other quantity. So the, the conjecture is that there's always a quantity that you could put here that you get this. Of course, you could put here something so small, so large, that you will get zero and everything. But you also want that the sum over y of this event uh, whatever you put here, in this case is t-mix, is going to be larger than one little o of one of the expected cluster size. Sorry? What is the stipulation? Yeah, well, what is it? I, I missed oh, the oh, oh, oh. I, Sorry, I forgot to say the t-mix in the hypercube, right? And uh, I think this answers your question. T-mix is m log m. Or a constant times m log m. Is this, was this your question? So x and y are connected by a path of length at least two mix. Yes. Yes. That's the notation. Yes. This is the notation. So this is somewhat strange because uh, you know there's here there's a random walk estimate and this is a percolation event, but the proof is you know it's, it's complete triviality. So let me show it to you. Uh, switch pen. So if this event occurs, this event occurs, then there exists a vertex v. And an open simple path, and an open and open simple path uh, omega from x to v of length uh, t mix, and v is connected to y disjointly. 
Or in other words, there's another open path of unbounded size, unbounded length, connecting V to Y, right? And now we just sum over everything and use the fact that these paths are disjoint. So there's a you know, familiar thing, BK inequality, this disjoint occurrence. So the probability is smaller than the, can you see here, Claire? Yes, the sum over, the sum over V, the sum over of these paths, W, the probability that this path, this, uh, the, this path is open, so open simple path, right, is P to the power M log M. Right? And, the pro and here I write the probability that V is connected to Y. So far, is this clear? All right. And now I'm going to do the first, the first thing that I'm going to do is instead of considering all the open simple paths, I'm going to consider all the non-backtracking, uh, not necessarily simple paths. So this is the first relaxation. The inequality is in the right direction. Instead of simple, uh, self-avoiding, I'm going to write non-backtracking. All right. The P, the P to the uh, probability m log m, I put the other way. And now I can, I can enumerate. So here, here is where the, the mixing time comes in. How many paths do I have of length, m, of, of length t mix which are non-backtracking? It's, it's uh, d to the minus 1 to the power t mix. d is the degree, so let's write n n minus 1 to the power of, okay, so it's n times n minus 1 to the power t mix minus 1, if you want to be precise. Doesn't really matter. This is the number of paths. How many of them end up in v? Right? These are the ones we're, we're enumerating on. And this is exactly what this is telling you. Right? This tells you that this is at most, the number of such paths is at most this to the power 2 to the n times 1 plus little o of 1. Right? So we, now we can put everything outside. There's a, there's a p to the power t mix. And here you see exactly where condition 2 in the assumption comes in. p to the power t mix, this is that. And the sum over v here gives you, because of here I'm using the fact that the graph is transitive, I get the expected cluster size at, at any vertex. All right? And because of this assumption, this is all... 1 over 1 plus O of 1, and we get this. Any questions about the lemma? All right. Generally, it's interesting. On the right-hand side, you would put max of X and Y plus K or something, if it's not necessary. Did I say that there's something more? I said that I believe that this should hold, that this condition doesn't, you know, I can only prove it when I have condition number 2. But this should hold, I think, perhaps with another value, you know, in, in other, in say, two-dimensional percolation, which, you know, all of these, or in any lattice, all of these assumptions don't, don't work. Uh, so, I don't really know. It could be, it's just a useful thing. Uh, so let me try to convince you. Where did the 1 over t thing come from? 1 to the what? Sorry? The definition of t mix. So, what? Mm -hmm. Okay. How do I use this thing? Uh, I'll try to tell you in, uh, in three minutes. Um, how do I, how do, so where does, it, why is this a useful thing? It's useful in two, very, in two important ways. So, the strategy in order to prove uh, step number two is, uh, you know, given that you know step number one, is that, you know, you start with two clusters, you start with two, sorry, vertices, x, y, right? And you want to, you know, you want to, you want to grow them. And you want to say, if they have grown enough, then, you know, I'm starting to see, you know, edges connecting them. Uh, so first, you know, you grow them a little bit, and you condition on what you see. So you, ha you kind of have to have a, a conditional statement. So you grow them separately a little bit, they've grown to here, and they are big, they contain about epsilon to the minus 2 vertices, their diameter is epsilon to the minus 1, 
And now you're conditioning exactly on what you see, and you want to say that, and, and now you have a vertex here, and you want to look at it, you know, at the future, and how much does it have expectation, how many vertices does it see in the future, and you want to say that, you know, so first thing you want to say is that this is large, that this did not consume a lot. Epsilon to the minus 2 is very small compared to epsilon to the 2 to the n because of our, because of this condition. And now, so now you want to perform some, uh, some, some second moment argument counting, just, you know, counting the number of, 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 of edges that you see that this one is connected to, this one is connected to from here, but this one is not connected. Right? So, what is Yuval's condition? You mean the triangle? The uh, triangle. No, this is not the triangle because this this will be a very large, this will be a very large uh, uh, path or, or cycle, and and the problem and the thing is so. The fact that you have, if you just wanted to compute this probability that x is connected to this and y is connected to this then there is no problem, because you know the probability, and, and these paths have to be disjoint, because you know the probabilities of, of both of these being connected, you know them by the lemma. But now, once you condition on, on like this crazy configuration that holds here, you, you, you can, what you see here can be completely thwarted. So the probability, you know, so the expectation of what you see, you know, you want to say that ex expectation of your future cluster is still of the size uh, of, you know, hasn't changed by much, it's this size. But of course, now that you've conditioned it, could be, it could be diverted to this side of the hypercube. And from this point, it could be converted to this side of the hypercube, and then they don't really have a chance to meet. But this lemma tells you that that can't happen, because all of the vertices and what's left have to receive more or less the same mass. Right? If, if you have this, if the sum of what you see in the future is this, and the lemma holds, you know, even with the conditioning, because everything is monotone, then you know that it has to spread equally on all the remaining vertices. So you could perform, you know, you just count the number of edges here, you perform a first moment, you perform a second moment, and you show that what you get here is enough edges, everything works out so you get, you know, exactly the, the number of edges that you want. And, uh, and that's it. And I think I'll, I'll stop here. Still using some ready regularity lemma? Uh, no, no. no. <laughs> we, we replaced it. If you want, I can tell you things we don't know how to do. Uh, but I'll take that as a no. <laughs> so uh, one thing we don't know how to do, for instance, is we don't. Uh, we think that the largest component has a has a CLT. We don't know how to prove it, so we know we have a law of large number for it, but we don't. We haven't obtained a central limit theorem. The second thing that we cannot do, so we can show this picture that the smallest, the second largest cluster is really smaller. We don't know how to show that its distribution, that or that it looks like the subcritical case, which is which we believe is true. Uh, this the same thing happens in Edish and Renyi, and there are other related questions we want to study. Yes. Like a really like, annoying question, but I was just curious if this has any applications. <laughs> uh, of course, I'm uh, serious about Fabio, this question. Fabio, why did you say that? Uh, like, you the don't study, have to give the study of glasses in uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, quantum physics. How about that? No. <laughs> study of glasses in quantum <laughs> physics. Uh. No, I meant also like in algorithms. You know, like if you know of anything that it doesn't have to be like real world applications. It's like, I see. you know what I mean? Like, how yeah. can this be used? <laughs> uh, to get like, me a job? <laughs> 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 That's a real world. <laughs> I'll uh, take there, there is no, there is no, like, if you want a serious answer, there is no serious applications that I know of. Uh, the method, you know, Aitash Komlos and Semeri, the sprinkling, this has been used all over the place, right? And in a lot of computer science, the same ideas. It's not even questions about percolations. Uh, Gian used it recently. There's, you know, the methods are sometimes useful. I'm not even claiming that these methods will be useful to anyone or anywhere. I think the progress of moving beyond using isoperimeter 
inequalities for general sets and using structure of the specific sets, which had some of that in earlier work. But that's, that's I think, an important point. Uh, okay. I'm not trying to say that this is not important or it does the matter. But that would be right. By no means. I just was wondering where I could use the uh, results. <laughs> You know, if I wanted so, to, to, to do something like that. But you know, you don't know, I'll figure it out myself. So, okay. Exactly. Well, one thing is, you know, in other applications where isoparametric inequalities are used, and they're used a lot, you know, can you, so one lesson from this is, in your specific application, maybe your sets have more structure, or in a such case, actually more randomness, mm -hmm. that means that they have better isoparametric properties than are guaranteed by the general. Oh, we so should write this down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a really, that's Selling really them. important, and in fact, it's, I mean, that's been used in other cases, but this is maybe the most spectacular example. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds... All right. Thank you.